You're watching LMCC, your community TV. Hi there, and welcome to this edition of Capital Update. Today, we have the honor of having Senator Osmick and Representative Hurtaz with us. We are missing our Representative uh, Cindy Pugh, but it is the holiday season and she just couldn't join us today. So, gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, Randy. I'd like to start off first with the congratulations, Representative. We just got through our election and, and you won handily. Do you want to talk about that just for a moment, about what uh, 33A thinks about their representative? Well, I uh, have worked hard in the in the district in the issues that I think matter quite a bit to the constituents in this district and we know that it is traditionally a very conservative district and I think I've been representing them well uh, certainly my legislative scorecards have indicated as such that uh, I'm a conservative representative from a very conservative district so and they rewarded you I, I believe you won by like 34 points so I think that's something to be to show that you're working hard and the district appreciates that. Yeah, so. my, my actual percentage went up uh, from my uh, freshman year in the election and um, so I was uh, pleased to, to see that and uh, basically that's kind of an indication to me that uh, voters are approving of my representation for them. Well, Jerry Stumanis, he actually has one of the highest indexes in the state of Minnesota and that's a, a attribute to uh, his leadership and his skills at the, at the legislature. So. I well, congratulate him on having one of the biggest wins in Minnesota. So, and you should, you should feel good about that. And Senator, thank you for bringing that up because I know you tend to be humble at times. And I, it's important for people to realize that you're working hard in representing us. So that's great. So, David, you didn't have uh, to worry about an election this time. You got to help Jerry and others across the state, which I know that you were out there working hard. Mm -hmm. But we are weeks away from, from starting into a new session. And the dy dynamics have changed. We go from one party rule to now a house that's controlled by the, the Republicans and a Democrat uh, governor and a Democrat Senate. So what do you guys see happening starting off in the, in the new year? Well, I'm still in the minority. Yes. So uh, I still have the pleasure of uh, Senator Bach being the leader of our chamber. Um, I think we're going to find that uh, we're going to have some bipartisanship. And I think we found out over the last two years that some very, very good ideas were presented by the Republicans, particularly in, this, in the case of perhaps Minsure, where we could have had a, set up the board, and one of the amendments I had to the Minsure bill itself was to actually allow a person with healthcare uh, technology experience to be on the Minsure board, and that was defeated by the Democrats. They did not want to listen to common sense solutions which would have helped us prevent the Minsure issues that we're having today. Somebody with that technology experience could have told, asked questions and pointed to the pitfalls of where they were going to. Um, see, I think those types of uh, suggestions are gonna be taken, there's gonna be more credibility done to this now because our friends over in the House and the Republican side now will have the gavels and some of the good ideas that we did have are probably gonna be able to see the light of day. Well, that'll be good. It's always nice to have a balance like that to have Boy, of all sides being heard in this case. So it's nice that we have, uh, you know, we being the Republican side of the House has a voice at the table. Jerry, do you want to add on to what, what Senator just said? Well, thanks, Randy. Um, I think you summarized exactly what I uh, feel very strongly about in, in that divided government does mean that all voices are heard. What we saw this last biennium is for the first time in more than 22 years, all three branches of government were controlled by one party. <clears throat> Some of us call that a trifecta. And uh, there are other trifectas around the nation, but it's been very unusual in Minnesota. We've had divided government for more than a generation, and this was an unusual circumstance. And uh, we saw plenty of symptoms of uh, too much spending and overreach, and I think the voters reacted accordingly. Okay, well, it'll be interesting to see, and we'll, we'll circle back around in the show here. Senator, I want to turn uh, to you. I'm sure the, the viewers are noticing some hardware in front of you, <laughs> and I think you should take, take some time and tell them about the awards that you've just received. Sure, thanks. Um, this, these are a couple of awards that uh, I, I normally don't want to roll them out too much, but I actually got these this week from <clears throat> two different associations. One is the Suburban Transit Association, which 
commonly is known as the opt-out carriers. Around the metropolitan area, we have a number of carriers that are not the Met Council. Met Council runs MTC buses, but we have uh, carriers such as Southwest Transit, Plymouth Metrolink that serve this, uh, this Senate district uh, that actually provide an independent service of, of transportation people want. They get into these buses, they have express service into downtown and St. Paul and Minneapolis, and they provide an actual transit option for people who really want it. It gets cars off the road. And uh, last session, I was able to get uh, over the objections of my committee chair, I was able to get an amendment to uh, take some of the surplus that we had and invest it into these opt-out carriers. Uh, we had $3 million earmarked for them. I, earmarked isn't quite the right term, mm -hmm. but um, we had $3 million taken from Met Council and given to them so that they could continue to expand and increase their service because people really like that kind of transit. Uh, so these are a couple of awards from the Opt-Out uh, Transit Association or the Suburban Transit Association and from Southwest Transit for my work on that. They did actually, even though the three million was not, did not completely make it through to the final bill or to the final bills that came up, um, they did receive a substantial in one-time increase so that they could you know, increase their bus service, provide better bus service, Put, take care of delayed problems or delayed uh, payments that they need, needed to make to make their service a better service. So it's good. Uh, I don't do these things. I don't do bills like that because I'm looking for awards, but it is great when people recognize the fact that you do the hard work behind the scenes that people do appreciate. And this is a transit option people like. Republicans sometimes are painted saying we're, we're against transportation, we're against transit. That's not true. We're for transit that works. And in this case, those opt-out carriers really do a great benefit for the metro area. Well, well done. And thank you. Well received. So thank you. I'm going to use that as a, go ahead, Senator, or Representative. Well, I was just going to also uh, congratulate David for uh, receiving the awards. He's uh, really, uh, as a freshman, Senator has uh, done very well for representing the district and uh, the interest in spending dollars on transportation in, in a wise way, uh, not uh, on new enterprises. And so uh, certainly uh, getting those awards uh, is an acknowledgement of, of doing that good work. And another example of where uh, those of us out on the west side, not just Senator Osmick and myself, but uh, even including some of the DFL representatives on this side, you know, we were ab able to rally behind uh, getting MnDOT to actually uh, get this uh, third general purpose lane built and is uh, the construction has started. So, uh, you know, with a little bit of pressure and a little bit of influence and a little bit of representation, we can actually get some things done that are benefiting uh, folks out on this side of town. That was the last two lane stretch of interstate in the uh, metro region and, and it uh, was sorely needed. And for any of the consumers that are watching or constituents that are watching uh, know what a what a gridlock uh, situation that was to waste uh, time and resources and labor idling on the highway. So One other thing, Jerry, talk about, uh, we're involved in the Highway 12 coalition. We actually are involved in two of them. And there's been some, uh, there, there have been some accidents out there. Why don't you tell people about what we've been doing with Highway 12 and actually some things that got done very recently to help that safety in that area? Well, thanks, uh, Senator Osmick. Uh, Last summer, uh, we started a Highway 12 coalition meeting, and we've been having uh, regular meetings uh, with uh, representatives from MnDOT, from each of the uh, locales that are adjacent to Highway 12 uh, in the district, uh, also uh, other representatives um, from other governmental agencies. We've been meeting out in Delano, and uh, we've been studying crash data and crash statistics and uh, listening to testimony from the police departments and whatnot. The first responders who actually show up at these scenes and have a, a little bit of an opinion about it. Interestingly, it was uh, resolved in the committee that a lot of the data really isn't good data because it gets down to those first responders filling out reports to the state have to check boxes. And if some of the circumstances aren't described on a box, they're left with the discretion of, you know, was, was there any injuries? Well, any injuries was, did, it, did they get sent to the hospital? They could have still had injuries, but not being sent to the hospital. So there are a lot of serious crashes, both on uh, Highway 12 and Highway 55. Highway 55 is uh, somewhat better shape, uh, not considered as much of a rural highway because we've got divided four lane uh, through kind of the center of the district. And um, so we've been working in those areas and most recently, uh, as most uh, 
folks are aware, we had uh, a volunteer come forward with the equipment and manpower and resources to uh, ask for MnDOT's permission to be able to put in some rumble strips as an interim measure to kind of let people know they're drifting over the center line. It's a, a narrower U.S. highway and uh, some curves in it. And uh, I think uh, with the increase of uh, inattentiveness of driving and being distracted by a lot of things, whether they're electric devices or whether it's other things on the road, uh, people aren't, uh, you know, staying in control of their vehicles and they're not driving as defensively as they ought to. And there's really no reason and there's no explanation why two vehicles in the last week have drifted over the center line and have ended up in uh, head-on crash fatalities. So, right. so it's a, a tragic thing for those families. My heart goes out to all of those who have lost a loved one over this stuff. But uh, we, we need to really be spending our money on priorities and making what we have in a transportation system safer. Well, I agree. And I think it's good that you guys are listening and, and trying to come up with some solutions in the rumble strips. While a lot of people don't like the rumble strips, they're effective and they let you know and put you back. It could be from falling asleep as well. We don't know. Right. But I'm glad that you guys are involved with that. One other thing that we're working on, too, is right on the edge of the district, the entry, the eastbound entry point of Wyzetta Boulevard onto Highway 12, where, where 494 veers off. Uh, that one is a very, that's a big problem in the mornings, and we know it. I've been working uh, the last year and a half with MnDOT to talk about the Diamond Lane. We got some restriping done at the, at where the divide or the two lane section of 12 starts on the west side of Wyzetta. But I'm continuing to follow up with, Met, with uh, MnDOT and they are, they are promising to put in a auxiliary lane at Wyzetta Boulevard to ins expand it from three lanes, Diamond Lane plus two, to Diamond Lane plus three so that inbound traffic has more space to merge in it. So that's something that we're that's keeping huge. an eye on. That's a, that's a big bottleneck. I mean, it's, it's a yep. Western problem, right? But it's still an issue that slows down, especially in you know spring and fall when the sunlight's coming in there. It's, it's a dangerous area, it truly is. And even though I'm not on the <laughs> Transportation Committee and I've asked to be on it uh, two bienniums in a row, um, the, our leader hasn't seen fit to uh, give me that privilege of serving on it. But it doesn't mean that because you're not on the committee, you can't still be active and uh, represent our uh, constituents. So uh, we're able to sit in on the meetings and uh, make contributions even though we're not committee members and you know able to keep working in these areas. So I wholly intend to uh, support uh, Rep or, uh, Senator Osmek and Representative O'Neill uh, to the west of us is also on transportation sure. in the House Committee. And uh, we were, three of us were just at a meeting this morning on the Highway 55 Coalition, so. Well, neat. Well, I'm gonna use this to transition to a topic that we were talking about before we came on air. And that's that you have a bill that you're going to be bringing forth that has to do with the Met Council. And I find it to be a really interesting bill as a mayor, past mayor. Um, so I'm just going to tee it up like that and let you explain a little bit more about this bill and what, what you see happening and what you think might happen with it. Sure. It's Actually, I think it's a really good bipartisan approach. Last year, or last session uh, on one of the bills, the Met Council on session bill, uh, I had an amendment to do something like this. And then when I was well, walking... Let's explain what... Right, when I was walking out of the chamber, the DFL was actually telling me that might not be such a bad idea. So here's the plan. Right now for the Met Council, there's 16 Met Council reps plus the chair that's appointed by the governor of the state of Minnesota to serve for four years at his pleasure. Um, what, ha what happens is the governor appoints and then the Senate gets to do its confirmations. In between those two, my, my bill would put in a layer that says, okay, governor, you get to appoint, nothing changes there. Senator, senators, you still get to do your confirmation hearings, but when the governor appoints, as soon as the governor makes that appointment and starts down the path of the Senate, that will trigger a 90-day window. The 90-day window will be an opportunity and a requirement for our uh, Metropolitan Council representatives to go to their districts. They have geographic districts just like I have, just like Jerry has where they have to go and get a resolution of support from their city councils. And if they don't get at least 50% of the city councils in their district to give them a resolution, just by passing a resolution at their city council meetings, they will not be confirmed and they automatically, the governor has to go back into reappointment. What this does is it gives city councils, and we all three of us have been on city councils before, it gives us at the, at the local level an opportunity to actually look at the, the qualifications of that individual to see do they match what we believe in as far as our priorities are in each individual city. Now, 
you still may not necessarily get the person you want, but what it will do is give you an opportunity to say, no, this person doesn't work. Also in the bill, there's, an opt -out, there's a provision that will actually recall them. If a Met Council during their term, Met Council rep decides to vote on something or do something or not support their area, if, the council, if your city council passes a resolution of recall, that triggers another 90-day window where if more cities, at least 50%, also recall that person, then that person's removed and the governor goes back through the appointment process. What it will do is make those people come out and show their qualifications. Right. You get to know them and it will bring diversity of opinion to the Met Council because right now they really many times will say, well, I serve at the pleasure of the governor, so I need to follow whatever the governor says. No, you serve a district. You serve the people in that district, and it will bring a diversity of opinion. And so far, I have not, I've talked to many mayors from all the way up north in Dayton, all the way down to Eden Prairie and Chanhassen. I haven't found one mayor yet that doesn't think this is a, is a, that doesn't think this isn't a good idea. I also talked to one of the Met Council reps, Representative Rodriguez in District 1, and she actually likes the proposal. So I think we have an opportunity to have a very bipartisan approach with this. Senator Rest, who's a DFL or a New Hope in that area, in Plymouth area, she actually is going to be the second, or she's going to sign on to the bill. She's already committed to that. Uh, so we're looking at a good bipartisan mix, and hopefully we'll get this through the legislature. I like, I like the bill. You know, see if it'll come that way. But I think it's a good idea to give, well, you know, the Met Council tells us as council, you know, members, they, they dictate us with these unman, unfunded mandates so many times, and our only recourse sometimes is to go all the way back to St. Paul and try to get into a meeting and be heard for two minutes. I think this is a great opportunity to give that power back to the communities that are being, you know, pushed on the most by the Met Council. Well, you, and, I, and I think it's also, uh, as has already been mentioned, important to uh, remind uh, the representatives that serve on the Met Council that they're supposed to be representatives of the district. And uh, Senator Osmick already alluded to the idea that, well, they're appointed by the governor, so if they're just coming out to the districts to be a mouthpiece for the Met Council and not truly representing the districts that they're supposed to represent, uh, that's pretty frustrating. Right. When I was a mayor and we were having comprehensive plan uh, reviews and update issues. Um, we had a representative at that time, uh, not Miss Rodriguez, who was a new representative, but a former one who, uh, when we're all down there as a city council in St. Paul, uh, advocating for a revision in our comprehensive plan, we didn't even have a representative that was uh, representing us or even uh, making a motion to, to second adoption or just totally absent. So, I mean, it really wasn't representation at all, and uh, Senator Osmick's bill might help address some of those issues in terms of being addressed. And a lot of it comes down to how much do you know about your soil and water commissioner? Your soil and water commissioner is on the ballot. Well, there's some people on our side of the political aisle that say it should be elected. The, the problem is, is that the people who know the most about whether that Met Council rep works for you, if you want to get rid of them, or if they have the right qualifications, are the people at the cities because they deal with the Met Council on any comp plan amendments, they deal with them for any sewer issues, water issues now because they're starting to put their toes into that. You know, there's a lot of connectivity between your local city of government and the Met Council. And uh, those people at the local level, they know exactly what they're looking for, and they know if their rep is supporting them or not. Boy, I, I could see this bill being pushed down into other entities as well, where the, the local community should have a right to affirm or disaffirm as well, if that's the right way of saying that, you know, to make life easier. Because there's a lot of entities out there that make our life as council members and mayors less than enjoyable. Well, one of, one of the uh, problems that most uh, mayors and city councils view with regard to the Met Council, and it's not unique to the west side of town, it's really somewhat universal, and as a member of the state legislature, there's many other mayors and council members that are now legislators, and there seems to be a, a common shared consensus that this Met Council over four or five decades has metamorphosed into something much greater than really was intended to be. And it started out essentially as the Metropolitan Sewer and Water Waste Commission. And uh, it is now, uh, you know, reaching into all sorts of different areas uh, of uh, developing policy plans and uh, claiming to have statutory authority over stuff which uh, most people disagree with. So we're, uh, we're kind of at a crossroads, I think, with the future of the Met Council and whether or not uh, people uh, living in communities have had enough of it, whether leadership within those communities have had enough of it. 
a uh, little bit more about local control and not so much of this overreaching thing. There's only seven regional areas in the country that have a, a overreaching extra bureaucracy like this, and uh, this uh, really needs to be curtailed a little bit. Well, hopefully this bill will help you know, do that and, and raise the fact that it's out there, because most people, if you walked out of this room and out of our circle of friends, wouldn't have an idea what the Med Council is or what they do. We just happen to be geeks into that kind of stuff and, and, and know. So it's, but the listeners should be aware that this is occurring and hopefully your bill will get passed and get the support that it needs because I think that would be great. I'm looking so, forward to it. Fantastic. Jir, um, as we look forward to the next session, do you have any bills that you're looking to, to author or sponsor? Well, there's uh, a few things, a few initiatives that I'm working on. One is going to, uh, to lower the threshold for communities that would qualify for Minnesota State Aid Highway funds. Um, currently, that's set at 5,000 in population or greater. Uh, I'm going to be introducing uh, something that will probably lower that threshold. I've studied the numbers of cities in the state of Minnesota and lowering that threshold to half that amount to 2,500 would certainly aid all of those fringe communities in the metro area here, as well as some other uh, larger communities in greater Minnesota, but in particular where we've seen development leapfrog beyond the jurisdiction of the Met Council, we had uh, development further out and we're seeing some of the impact on the roads and maintenance issues of those fringe communities such as Independence or Minnetrista, Greenfield, uh, Corcoran is an, another good example. Some of these communities are over that threshold already. Some of them are getting close, but I think it would uh, be of uh, significant help. Um, there's another issue that, uh, that I'm concerned about, and I'm going to uh, be working on legislation to clear up and define what residency is in Minnesota. Um, during the last biennium, there was a fourth tier of income tax that was implemented. Uh, on highest uh, wage earners. It was originally billed and sold and marketed as only affecting millionaires, but in fact what became law was if you're a single tax filer at $130,000 of income, you're at the maximum tax rate in Minnesota. As a joint couple, it's about double that. And uh, what we have seen is a, quite a, a significant migration of uh, adjusted gross income leaving the state of Minnesota. It's Is that verifiable? I mean, people would sit here and say that you're just making that up. That's no, the, the Tax number. Foundation uh, has found that to be true, and I think it's evidenced by the fact that last year during the floor debate on the tax bill, I uh, warned Chair Lashensky, I said, just because you levy this tax doesn't mean you collect right. that you're going to collect it. And what I meant by that is you're going to encourage grandparents to move away from their children and their grandchildren, that they're going to seek to protect uh, their savings and their pensions from uh, this extra taxation. And uh, in many cases, uh, families look at it as a legacy in terms of what that additional premium means on, uh, on adjusted gross sure. income over, over 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, or even if you're entering retirement. Even a, a fireman and a school teacher uh, with a uh, state or, or municipal county pension uh, finds that is very difficult to want to retire in Minnesota if you're going to be subjected to this maximum tax rate. Yeah. And we've so, already actually started to see that because when we have the surplus projections and we had that rather recently, one of the parts of that report was that the amount of money captured from people who are working from their salaries is actually below projections. So we're starting to see some of that and was part of the concerns that were raised. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it, it's evident that people are leaving and I haven't really gone uh, any occasion of not hearing less than one or two stories a week since the law was passed that people have said, I've had enough, I'm checking out, I'm leaving. And, and That's uh, a true concern. I mean, well, it is a concern because it's not just the 2% the increase, which is about a 25-30% increase in income taxes for those filers, right. but then it's not that you're, you're not getting that extra 2%, you're not even getting the 7.8% that originally if they would stay sure. here. So once they leave, they're not coming back. You lose all of the income tax rather than getting that premium. And worse is you're not getting any of the tax that occurs from their consumption being here. All of the sales tax right. that's collected and the every time a dollar changes hands, there's income tax that's yeah. picked up. So uh, it's, a, it's a real economic uh, concern in terms of uh, not driving a, lo a lot of the small uh, job creators and business owners out of the state. Mm. 
Now we're wrapping up here. We, we've got just a few minutes. Do you have something quick, Senator? Uh, I'm going to have a busier legislative session than I thought I was going to be because uh, earlier this week I was uh, promoted to ranking member on the Energy and the Environment and Energy Commi Committee. So um, it's uh, rather unusual for a freshman to uh, have that designation. So I'm looking forward to working with Senator Marty, seeing what we can do to do the right thing for Minnesotans and its energy policy. Uh, I do have a couple of energy bills ready to go, um, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But it is, uh, it's an honor that my uh, colleagues have put me in charge of, uh, of a committee and being the ranking member. So. Well, congratulations thank again. You. Awards and appointments and bills coming forward. Gentlemen, both of you, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. You get out there, and many times you get calls and emails that aren't pleasant, but you're doing a great job representing 33 and 33A, respectively. And I look forward to uh, having this show after session, maybe we do it before session is over, just to see how things have changed having you know, two-party control now and what's going to happen, because I'm certain that we're going to see a lot of headlines that we can't even predict right now that's going to happen during session. So. And, and one more congratulations is in order. Uh, thanks to uh, our moderator. He uh, got engaged last week, and uh, <laughs> congratulations on that, and you, uh, best of wishes to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, gentlemen, thanks for being here, and um, thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you the next time on Capital Update.